Um, it is my pleasure to welcome our moderator, Olivia Montano, who is a senior director at the Prose Foundation. Um, and Olivia, before I hand it off to you, I want to mention uh, with the lightning round, we've got people presenting in rapid succession. Um, I will help you all keep track of time by giving you a one minute warning through a chime. Uh, the feedback yesterday was that the chime was rather subtle. And so today we have a slightly uh, more bold one. It sounds like this. Great. So if you're in the middle of your presentation and you can hear that, it means you've got about a minute to wrap up. And with that, Olivia, I will hand it off to you. Thank you so much. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this session. Um, I'd like to, to start off by uh, announcing our, our first presenter. It is Samantha Baxter. She is Associate Director of Genetic and Genomic Data Sharing in the Translational Genomics Group at the Broad Institute of MIT in Harvard. Hi, thank you. So uh, just let me share my screen. Hopefully you can all see my um, somewhat boring title slide, but I promise the rest of it will be much better. Uh, so um, thank you for the introduction. I will be taking you through um, the GBE1 prevalence study that we did uh, along with APBD Research Foundation earlier this year. Um, this will be a whirlwind tour of this study. It normally takes us about an hour to get through all the data that we uh, uh, collect during this process, but um, I will do my best to get it together in 15 minutes for all of you. So this is the project that I refer to um, as putting the pieces together for disease prevalence. So uh, in this study, we use varying databases to estimate disease prevalence for autosomal recessive conditions. So how do we put the pieces together if we want to estimate uh, the prevalence of a rare disease? Well, we take a slightly different approach from sort of the typical public health perspective where we look for numbers of cases or individuals affected. The fact that we turn it on its head, we say if we know the variants that are causing disease, can we use the, uh, the variants that we know about and then go and look at population data to see how frequent or absent those variants are um, and then use that frequency information to then uh, estimate the, the uh, carrier frequency and therefore the prevalence of disease. In order to do that, we have to start with um, really the backbone of this study, which is what are the variants that cause particular disease? So in this case, we started with GBE1, and we went into databases like ClinVar, HGMD, any disease-specific databases that we know about. And we say, please give us all the variants where anybody has given any reason that they think this is pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Um, we also go into our population database, referred to as NOMAD, um, and said, can you let us know about any loss of function variation in that uh, database, regardless of whether or not it's been seen in patients? Reason B is that we know not all variants that cause disease have been reported um, yet. There are populations that are under, um, underrepresented, underscreened. We know that testing um, is not something that's universally available. It's getting better and better, but there are limitations. And we know that the vast majority of variants um, that cause recessive disease do result in loss of function. So then once we have that list, we go through a curation process. I'm a variant curator um, and genetic counselor by training, and so I uh, this is really the, the fun part for us. Um, but we look at those variants and we say we look at all the evidence around them and say, do we think this causes disease or not? Once we have that final list, like I said, we aggregate the allele frequencies and move on to the calculation stages. So when we talk about curation, there's actually two types of curation that we perform. And when I say curation, really what that means is that we look for all the evidence around a variant and use that evidence to decide whether we think this um, either causes disease or results in loss of function. We have two different processes. The first is the ACMG and AMP guidelines um, that came about in 2015. These are the gold standard within the clinical genomics community. So um, there is a very large um, sort of a table of evidence that we look at. We um, then used uh, various metrics to decide whether that um, supports pathogenicity or does not support path pathogenicity. It tells us whether to apply that as a strong level, a moderate level, a low level. Um, and then what you do see on uh, your screen on the left-hand side, sort of the algorithm for once you find all this evidence, how do we add that up to come to a classification? 
there's a second class or um, curation process that we use, which is the loss of function curation process. This is a process that was developed within our group at the Broad Institute um, and part, as part of the NOMAD team and is specific to our group and the fact that we developed it, but it, we are in the process of writing it up and working with the ClinGen community to get what we've learned out there. Um, and uh, the main point of this is that loss of function is a term that um, if you work in the genetics world, you hear quite a bit, but really what it's, it's saying is that we believe that the variant or the change in the, um, the genetic code is leading to the protein itself not being able to function either through nonsense mediated decay or other mechanisms. However, when you see loss of function actually written out um, in a database or some other place, often that's an annotation or something that a computer has decided if you change this A to this T, we think it results in loss of function. It's not actually going in and looking at the protein and seeing that. And so what we've learned is sometimes there's something that looks like loss of function on a piece of paper, but there's reasons around that variant that we realize it doesn't actually cause loss of function. So, you know, 15 years ago when I started variant curation, we saw something that said loss of function, great, this obviously causes disease. We've grown up a lot and we've learned a lot and realized that there's specific errors or information we should be looking at to decide whether or not this causes disease. So the main three errors we look at are um, technical. A lot of the information within research databases uh, or population databases, I should say, are research grade sequencing. They're not a clinical test where there's confirmation and additional studies done. So we can sometimes find these technical errors that if we were to try to clinically confirm them, they're not actually real variants. They're just errors caused by the sequence or by the reference. Um, also, there's something called rescue errors. This is um, a catch-all for a couple different things, but essentially what happens is if you look at that variant alone and you don't think about what's going on around that variant, you could say it's loss of function. But in reality, there might be another variation happening right next to it, that when you combine those two variants together, it does not result in loss of function. It leads to the loss of a single amino acid or something called a missense change where one amino acid gets swapped for another amino acid. The protein is still able to be built. It might be slightly different, but it doesn't necessarily result in loss of function. The last is not something that's relevant for this group, but it's just something I'll let you know about, which is um, an impact error, meaning that the um, area of the gene or the version of the gene that's being used, something called the transcript, um, isn't biologically relevant for the disease that we're looking at. So this, some genes this matters, some genes this doesn't. We didn't come across any of these when we were looking at GBE1. So once we had that variant list and we, we put it through the full curation, um, we spent quite a lot of time making sure, is this the exact list that we want to use? We recognize information changes over time. ClinVar is always growing. We're learning more and more. But we spend a lot of time saying, is this the most comprehensive list we can get? And are we being um, inclusive, but not overly inclusive? We don't want to include all these variants of uncertain significance um, or any benign variants that might inflate the frequency. Because once we have that final list, what we do is we go into NOMAD, our population database, and we say, give us all the allele frequency information. How many times were these variants seen in this average population? We look at this for not just the global population within NOMAD, but also the subpopulations in NOMAD, which you see probably in pretty small writing on your screen off here on the left. Um, one thing to point out is these are um, continental or subcontinental populations. However, these are genomically determined subpopulations. So this is not self-reported data. This is similar to something you might see in 23andMe or Ancestry.com, where it tells you, based off your genetics, what's your likely ancestral background. Slightly different from those databases, um, our algorithm only assigns you to one um, uh, population background. We know that is not the case with humans. That's definitely a limitation. We're all hybrids and all different backgrounds, but sort of the nature of where algorithms are, um, we try to put people into single boxes. We are hoping to improve that in the future um, and maybe even be able to do that at, at smaller and smaller locations down to a gene or even a part of a gene, but right now that's where we are at. For the actual calculations, once we have that list and we have the allele frequencies, we apply something called the Hardy-Weinberg uh, equation, which is the uh, mathematical expression of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium um, hypothesis, which states that the balance of the reference allele or normal allele, basically what we would expect to see, the amount, the percentage of that 
um, against the percentage of the variation that we see, that those should remain constant from one generation to the next. So in a very high frequency world, half the individuals have um, your reference allele, half the individuals have your variant, that that should be the same in the next generation as well. Um, good news for math is that in very rare disease, the percentage of individuals who have the sort of reference allele or normal allele is so close to one that mathematically we can assume it to be one. And so that it makes very simple math in the sense that um, uh, we use Q, which is um, just the abbreviation that is used in this uh, principle, is the allele frequency of all the likely path and pathogenic variants within a particular gene. So we add up what is the allele frequency for all the variants in our list? Once we add them, that is our aggregate allele frequency. Uh, if we times that by two, that's our carrier frequency. And that's because everybody gets two copies of their alleles, one from mom, one from dad. So we take the allele frequency times it by two, and that's the estimated carrier frequency, or we square that allele frequency. And that gives us our disease frequency or our disease prevalence. Uh, once I go to the next slide, I will be showing you the numbers for GBE1. Just one thing to note, the conservative number is where we only use pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants. But we've also started to return this relaxed frequency, which are variants that were originally thought by somebody in ClinVar or HGMD to be likely path or path. But when we did that gold standard curation, it didn't quite make the mark. It only got to VUS. But we've recognized that some of those will likely become pathogenic over time, not all of them, but it's an estimate. And it sort of gives an upper bound and a lower bound to these ranges. Um, just a reminder again, these are all estimates. Things are changing all the time. Um, I also broke the uh, estimates down by the sub diseases, GSD4 and APBD. This was also an estimate. We attempted to assign each variant to a disease or perhaps both um, and try to give a range of what we think are the likely frequencies for these diseases. So here's the slightly overwhelming table. Um, and I will show this in bar chart form as well to make it a little easier for everybody to visualize the trends. But given the um, variants that we looked at, we estimate to have a conservative um, carrier frequency for all GBE1 uh, diseases um, to be about one in 280. The relaxed goes to about one in 185, GSD4, one in 400-ish, uh, relaxed, one in 300, APBD, you see a conservative carrier frequency of about one in 1,000, and a relaxed carrier frequency of about one in 400. There's one particular variant that actually makes a big difference here, and I'll talk about that in a couple slides. I do want to call out one obvious trend you will see as soon as I get to the bar charts is the much higher frequency within the high Ashkenazi Jewish population. Not too surprising based off of what everybody is talking about, um, but I did want to call out that carrier frequency, especially with an APBD, was significantly higher, being about 1 in 50. Uh, the prevalence um, follows similar trends. So for time's sake, I'm not going to spend too much time going into all of these, but a conservative uh, prevalence of about 1 in 325,000 for all GBE1 and an APBD um, conservative prevalence of about 1 in 4.6 million. If you look at the bar chart again, we just do this. It's all the same numbers, just put in a different way for people to visualize sort of the trends. Um, and we do show you a couple different bits of information in here. Um, one, it's very obvious here to see the Ashkenazi Jew are the Jewish higher carrier frequency. You can also see there's a slightly higher carrier frequency in the Swedish population. And this was driven by one variant in particular, and is actually a GSD4 variant, not an APBD variant. For time's sake, I'm not going to go too far into that, but happy to discuss discuss it at a later point if anybody's interested. We look at the distribution of the known variants, the purple here that were found in ClinVar and HDMD against the ones that were only seen in Nomad. We like to see more purple than red unless it's a very underdiagnosed disease. So we do this sort of as a QC to make sure there's no um, high frequency alleles that we don't think cause disease have never been seen in anybody sort of overtaking the calculation. So this looks nice and clean. And then I also mapped out the different diseases against the overall carrier frequency. So you could see the distribution of APBD versus both or GSD4 um, within each of the subpopulations as well. We did this similarly for the relaxed carrier frequency. Um, 
actually very good that we didn't see a big jump in the red and the relaxed, meaning we were introducing a lot of these um, uncertain significance variants that we also haven't seen in individuals. And then you can see that there was a higher um, proportion of variants that were seen in both individuals. I won't spend too much time because I could talk for a while about a variant that's being in, seen in both of these subpopulations and if they're more common, whether that means they're truly disease causing or not. But it is sort of an area to show it's a, an interesting place to dive into more. Uh, conservative uh, prevalence and relaxed prevalence will follow the same trends because, again, it was just timesing up by two or squaring it. So the trends would be the same. But I did want to show it without the Ashkenazi Jewish um, population just so you can better appreciate the trends in the other populations as well. Same thing for the relaxed. And then this is a slide I like to take a little bit of time and have a conversation about because I think it's a very natural and human thing to say, you gave me this weird fraction, I'm gonna times it against the world's population because this will put it in the context of individuals and my brain can handle that. Totally normal, a lot of people do it. I do it whenever I give a talk, but I like to type time and hold space for the conversation about all the caveats against doing that. Um, the most important one is that nomad, nomad is not representative of the entire world's population. We currently have about 125,000 individuals in Nomad. We're actively working on launching our newest version of Nomad, which will have over 750,000 individuals, so about 150 alleles, or, sorry, 150 million alleles. Certainly that is a lot of individuals, but we are not equally covering all the continents and countries and populations and in the world. And so um, we know that we have very limited information from Russia, from China, a, a lot of Asia, um, and most of Africa. And that is the significant portion of the world. However, it does at least give us to admit and something to be thinking about. So there are caveats and limitations to this, but I think it anchors the conversation and allows people to digest this information in some way. So the conservative estimate for GBE1 related diseases would be about 24,000 individuals. GSD4 would be about 10,000 individuals. APBD is about uh, 1,700 individuals. You do see that relax jump up quite a bit to 11,000. Um, there is one variant in particular, this missense variant listed below the slide, um, that uh, makes up the vast majority of that jump. And so, um, Without that, um, I have one minute, but I think that'll actually be perfect. Um, without that, the relaxed estimate would only be close to about 2000. So it is a pretty tight range there. Um, and I think it just ca calls out the importance of functional validation and following up on this missense variant to really figure out what the range of APDBD prevalence is. Um, we also did this for the Ashkenazi Jewish population, so taking the carrier frequency within that population doing it. Not surprising to any of you that the vast majority of individuals would be expected to have some Ashkenazi Jewish background, not all of it. And I think that was a great point that was made earlier, that it shouldn't just be those four variants and it shouldn't just be looking at people with Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. However, there is strong evidence to show that you should at least be thinking about that um, when you do see uh, this diagnosis. We, did, um, we can do this beyond just all variants. We can do it for single variants. So we know that the founder variant and then also an intronic variant are two of the most, um, they, they kind of um, contributed to the vast majority of the prevalence. So we repeated this analysis with just those two variants. So we could see how much of the proportion um, was from these two variants alone. Um, and then the last thing that I will quickly plug is that we are working on an online calculator that will allow any researcher, or any person in the world that will be totally open source to do this analysis for their gene of interest. And we're hoping to launch that later this year. We do have recruitment efforts, but for sake of time, um, I will not get to that right now. And thank you to everybody, including my team who does the vast majority of this work um, and all the curations. I just get to be the person to present it. Thank you. That, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. No problem. Uh, and uh, and uh, I know that there are questions already starting to come in, but we will hold them until the end of the session. Um, yeah, they're very exciting. Um, next, actually, uh, we were forewarned. This is going to be a lightning round. Uh, this is the first of, uh, of uh, three sessions. Um, I'd like to present Dr. Rebecca Koch. Uh, postdoctoral associate from the Department of Pediatrics at Duke University Medical Center, um, and she will be presenting next. Thank you. Thank you. I like I'm on the screen. 
Is that the right screen? <laughs> okay, I'll take the no no's as, as a yes. Um, so perfect. So, okay, perfect. So I, nice to see you all again. Um, again, I'm Becca. Um, I am a clinical and translational researcher at Duke. And so my hat that I'm wearing right now is going to be telling you, um, telling you more about our natural history study. Um, and so up front, I'm sorry if some of these slides repeat from what I just showed you, it's just, um, I want to clarify that this is again, including both of our pediatric and adult patients. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about what this natural history study is and what we hope to get out of it, as well as since I know we have some patients here, just briefly going through um, what this would look like to um, encourage uh, the patients to enroll or also to share it um, for providers with their patients. So just a reminder, my core visual of APBD and GST4. APBD is a glycogen storage disease. Um, and again, that means that you cannot create or use glycogen properly. And so there are many types, but in this context, we're talking about glycogen storage disease type four. So again, it affects children in a variety of ways, as well as adults, which we all know uh, with APBD. So a natural history study is a very complex word uh, that is not too intuitive. And all that it means is that it collects information about a natural history of a disease in the absence of an intervention. So this is what the FDA uh, defines it as. And in particular for rare diseases, natural history information is usually not available or it's incomplete for most rare diseases. And so therefore it's particularly new for these diseases. So I could talk all day about why we need a natural history study. I know researchers will uh, jump at this because we really do need this. And the idea of a natural history study is not just to be a data silo. It's supposed to be out for the public uh, in publication. So that way we can all as a team better understand the disease and we don't have to replicate work. We don't want multiple institutions trying to do the same thing over and over again. We all um, have you know, tools and resources and luckily with this study, we've been able to capture the entire spectrum because it does include pediatric and adult patients. Um, and I don't mean for that to sound like we're only trying to target one. We're really not. We This is a hypothesis free uh, study. We're trying to gather as much data as we possibly can on the disease as a whole. Um, and so that way we can find, okay, are there trends in certain things? Are there things unique? You know, I know we know that there are, but are there things unique to APBD versus the pediatric form? Um, and what are the overlaps? What are things that are unique to APBD and we need to, we could better treat and, you know, bring, uh, bring light to that? Because I think in our uh, publications, I think everyone here can agree, there are some symptoms, and I know we'll talk about this later, that may be unique to a lot of patients or only in a smaller cohort and they don't have the representation that they need in the literature because again there's just a lack of reporting in general. So if you were go to or if you were to go to clinicaltrials.gov, this is what you would find. This is our study. So the reason it's titled GBE deficiency, GSD4, and APBD natural history study is I'm trying to make it as clear as possible what we're targeting. If I could, I would have made it GBE reduction and deficiency, but they, I was told it was too worried. So um, GVE again stands for glycogen branching enzyme and then deficiency meaning a reduction or deficiency of that enzyme. And then this is also diagnosed as glycogen storage disease type four as well as adult polygamic body disease or APBD. And it's the natural history study. Um, so again, this is taking place at Duke, but this is an international study. Um, and so meaning we're including patients from all across the world um, and again, the conditions that are listed here, this is helpful because when you go to search online or searching clinicaltrials.gov, you can easily just search by this condition or disease and this will pop right up. Um, so it's a way to find, you know, again, our pediatric patients and their parents are often only told about GSD4. They're never, they've never heard of APBD. And then of course for APBD, we wanna make sure that you can easily find this as well and not have to look for GSD type four. Everything else on here is really just more of um, information. Um, so if you were ever looking for the study ID, you can do that here. This is something that we find is helpful if you share with your medical uh, providers, just so they know you are in a study. Um, and that's more just for keeping track of, um, uh, again, if you were in a study. And so why are natural history studies so important? I, I hinted at this, but really to lay it out, it's to help researchers understand the disease progression. At a bare minimum, we need to understand how this disease is progressing, when certain symptoms are arising, um, and how, uh, how we could better develop treatment. So, you know, as we think about the clinical perspectives, we mentioned this yesterday, but um, some of the researchers were mentioning, we have to understand at what point we have to treat a disease as well. We need to know, okay, you know, is it too late at this point? 
or is this the perfect time or you know what considerations we have to have there and so unfortunately we still don't fully understand the disease progression of gst4 and apbd i think there have been some wonderful researchers that have put out um, a lot of data in the past couple of years to try and address this but really if we could do this internationally and have a giant cohort, um, that is where we're gonna get the most data and um, you know, represent the most amount of patients. It also provides details of how a disease affects people with a disorder. So not only from our point of view, but also how is it actually affecting the person? We could talk all day about leukodystrophy and white matter disease. And I don't know if Jennifer's here, but not to make fun of that. But um, you know, if we talk with the bladder, you know, what are the symptoms that we could actually affect as well? You know, all of this is all interrelated and all of these things are targetable um, at some point, but we need to know from the patient's perspective, what is the biggest burden and, and impact on quality of life? It also supports the development of treatments and therapies. I just hinted at that. And then it also helps us identify what unmet needs exist. So we could have conferences like this every year, which I hope we do. Um, but you know, we really still need to understand what unmet needs are there, especially as we think about the next few years, if we do have treatment going to the clinic, it's gonna become more and more apparent what these unmet needs still are. So just as an overview, um, if you were to summarize all the things we're capturing in the study, I call it the comprehensive medical record. We are actually collecting the medical record of these patients. And so we're collecting name, date of birth, gender, um, everything that's listed here um, that's been involved in your care. Um, and there is an option as well for de-identified data, which I can talk more about uh, with providers if they do have, um, if they believe that they have data that could be helpful for this. And I always like to emphasize, even the normal labs or MRIs and bladder tests are still important. I want to know if something was unremarkable or normal. Um, that is still important to us. We don't only want to see what was abnormal or elevated or you know um, deficient. I want to also know what is still unremarkable in these patients because even that can still be important. So this is what participation looks like. Um, a uh, uh, roadmap of course um, to walk you through this. So initially um, the patients themselves or the providers can contact us if, they've, um, if they're interested in enrolling, but also if they think that they have an eligible patient. Um, again, we can collect medical records uh, that are de-identified. So I can talk about that with providers who um, in those situations, as well as from international patients. And our study team can also accept medical records on deceased patients. So this is a very sensitive subject and I am completely empathetic to this part. And I just want people to know that if they do um, have someone who is deceased or you know, a loved one or a spouse or anything of that sort, we can accept records um, for those people if you think that you would like to consider that for research. So then from there, enrollment just looks like a phone or a Zoom call. Um, and we, we can talk about that, gathering records, um, and then a yearly follow-up and publishing results. So the main thing I just wanted to talk about here is with these records, um, it, we try and take all the load um, off of the patient. So really we'll just get the list of the providers from that patient. We'll do the hard work in getting those records to us. And then we follow up with them yearly to see if those providers are still the same. So this isn't something we wanna have a hard cutoff for. And then we continue to publish results. So I hinted at this earlier, but hopefully we have about three papers coming out this year. Again, it depends on how many personnel each year, but um, we're hoping to continue this as a process and not just keep this as something that, um, again, is a data silo. So if you have a patient or are interested in enrolling, there's a picture of me um, and you can contact me directly at my email or my phone number is listed there as well. I'm happy to talk more about uh, what the study is and what we hope to do with this data. Thank you very much, Dr. Cook. <laughs> nice and timely. Okay, uh, we continue on with our lightning round. Um, our next, I'd like to uh, present um, Genevieve Wilson. She's research assistant from the Division of the Neurogenetics NYU at Langone Health. Um, and hopefully, there you go. I think you might be on mute, Genevieve. Hi, is oh, that better? There we go. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm here today to provide a brief update on a symptom burden and quality of life survey for APBD. Um, first of all, we're going to talk about why patient reported outcomes are important. So Patient reported outcomes or PROS are assessments or questionnaires completed by patients about how they feel or function without interpretation from a physician. So this can cover aspects of a person's status that are not easily 
or objectively witnessed or measured, and health-related quality of life is a great example of this. Um, pros are also essential to the review process conducted by the FDA when evaluating an investigational product. So when we have um, an approved, we have to have an appropriate pro asking about health-related quality of life before we can have a clinical trial measuring changes in health-related quality of life. Um, and so the pros should ideally be disease specific as well, because if they include questions about the most impactful aspects of life for that disease population, you know, then they are going to be the most sensitive to actual changes in quality of life. Um, so currently there is no disease specific health related quality of life pro for APBD. Um, in previous research on the glycogen storage diseases, um, non-disease specific questionnaires have been used. Um, for instance, the 12 item and the 36 item short form health surveys, as well as the PROMISE questionnaires or the patient reported outcome management system questionnaires. Um, but these may not provide as specific or as concise of a way to measure symptoms that are most relevant to APBD. So our survey was an expertly designed questionnaire um, intended to capture overall quality of life, disease severity, and then numerous other factors affecting these outcomes. So first, the survey was designed in 2018 and then approved by the NYU IRB. It was piloted on a small group of patients, and then in 2019, it was disseminated internationally to 47 affected individuals. And affected individuals in this case are just defined as people who had a self-reported diagnosis. Um, the APBD Research Foundation then assisted, um, assisted with uh, facilitating survey completion, and then anonymous data was stored in REDCap and maintained by NYU. Uh, so our outcomes for this survey are current quality of life and overall disease severity as shown here. Um, and quality of life in, for our purposes in this, in this research uh, refers to health-related quality of life, so specifically related to disease. Um, general quality of life is a little bit different. So taking a look at our survey respondents, um, we had 36 individuals from six different countries complete the survey. Our population was about 80% Ashkenazi Jewish, which is consistent with other studies. Um, about 80% of the respondents were at least 60 years of age, and also about 80% were unemployed for a variety of reasons. Um, our population was also about half male and half female. And we do have a fairly homogenous population here as about 97% indicated that their race was white and 75% of the respondents came from the US. So just over half of our respondents experienced symptoms starting between the ages of 50 and 79. Similarly to many patients with rare disease, the majority experienced a long diagnostic journey after symptom onset lasting between one and 10 years. And for even about 30%, the journey lasted over 10 years. Um, in terms of specific symptoms, we do know that neurogenic bladder and progressive muscle weakness are some of the main symptoms that individuals with APBD experience. So we see that just over half were using at least one urinary retention treatment, and about 90% were using at least one assistive device to help with mobility. The most common of those assistive devices was actually a cane with just under 50% of respondents. Um, and looking at the relationship of assistive device use to our outcomes of quality of life and disease severity, using a man whitney U test, we saw that use of one, of one or more of these devices is significantly associated with a greater disease severity and a worse quality of life. We also know that neurogenic bladder is a common symptom in APDD, so about half of our survey respondents used at least one treatment for urinary retention. Uh, we can see here that the most common way to manage this uh, is with medication, and most of those medications are just intended to treat overactive, overactive bladder. Again, with the man whitney U test, we saw that being 60 years of age or older, so indicated by that purple box on the right there, is significantly associated with greater disease severity. Um, so a five on this scale is actually the greatest severity on that y-axis. Um, and while current age and quality of life were not significantly correlated, we do believe there was a, a clear difference in the means based on age group.
And with the Spearman correlation, we saw a significant relationship between the total symptom severity score and overall quality of life, as well as disease severity. So as total symptom burden increases, it appears that quality of life worsens and disease severity increases. So to obtain that total symptom severity score, or symptom burden score, the severity on a scale from zero to five for each of the 24 symptoms in the survey, and those symptoms are uh, specific to what people experience in APBD, um, they were added together to get this, this total severity score. So the higher the number, the higher the symptom burden. Um, uh, and when we look at each symptom individually, we see that the severity of about half were also significantly positively correlated with quality of life and disease severity. Um, and on this scale, as before, the five is um, five on the y axis is the worst quality of life, and one is the best. Um, and so when we look at each symptom individually, half of them were positively correlated with quality of life and disease severity. Actually, the most significant um, um, uh, symptoms that were correlated with quality of life were leg weakness, cognition, and fatigue with exertion. Okay. Similarly, our um, total activities of daily living or ADL difficulty score is significantly correlated with overall quality of life and disease severity. So when daily tasks are harder, overall quality of life worsens and disease severity scores increase. Again, these are patient reported outcomes. Um, to, re to obtain the total ADL difficulty score, the difficulty of completing each ADL on a scale from zero to five, with five being the hardest to complete that ADL, for a list of 22 ADLs were added together to get this total ADL difficulty score. So this just means that the higher the number, the greater the challenges experienced when completing ADLs. And each, each individual ADL severity score was also significantly positively correlated with quality of life and disease survey. Um, within our sample, the individual ADLs that were most significantly correlated or most strongly correlated with quality of life were getting dressed, going out socially, and doing housework. Okay, um, and both of the two previous graphs just help us to demonstrate the survey's validity because they show us that when symptom burden is greater and when individuals experience more difficulty with daily tasks, the quality of life score gets worse. So we'd also expect to see that greater disease severity is reflected by a worse quality of life score. Um, and our survey does show that internal consistency. It appears that there is significant positive correlation between the two meaning that greater disease severe, with greater disease severity, the quality of life score increases or worsens. So we saw why pros are important. And as this research about, is about survey development, it's notable that it was effective in measuring how symptom burden and difficulty of daily tasks are related to the outcomes of overall quality of life and disease severity. Um, so this is a novel tool, this survey, um, to be used in future research. We were able to capture individuals at a range of disease stages, but of course there are limitations um, to this study, namely that our population is small and homogenous, which is somewhat inevitable given our APBD population, as well as this survey being cross-sectional. So I'll just end with um, some of our future directions. So ongoing statistical analyses are continuing to look at internal relationships within the data. In the future to improve this survey and help validate it for use as a pro, the question and response wording and categories will be revised. The scoring procedures will be cle um, clearly defined. Um, and lastly, we'll look at this data over time. So we'll measure, uh, we'll see how quality of life changes over time. So thank you to everyone who contributed to this research. Um, our contact information is here in case you'd like to reach out. Thanks so much again for having me and I look forward to a great rest of the conference. Thank you very much, Genevieve. Thank you. Um, and with that, this uh, it, we come to the third session of the of the lightning round, and we've got some co-presenters for this one. We have JC Sparks, a biostatistics student, and also Francesco Michelassi, a neurology resident, and both from Columbia University. Hi, everybody. My name is JC. Um, I am a, yeah, biostatistics student at Columbia. Hi, and I'm Francesco, a neurology resident at Columbia. 
And today we're gonna to talk about the first patient reported natural history study of APBD um, that we did jointly with uh, the Research Foundation. Okay. So again, I am just a graduate student at Columbia University. Um, I'm actually graduating next week with my master's in biostat. And I'm, I'm also a resident and I'm actually going to be graduating from residency in uh, July. So um, the way that we split this project up, we wanted to originally kind of split it up into three different phases. Um, today, we're going to, going to talk about the first part, um, this retrospective CAP natural history study. And again, this is gonna be our main focus for today. So the APPD Foundation um, supports research and development of therapies to treat this disease. Um, APPD natural history studies are absolutely critical to understand the disease progression develop outcome measures and plan um, future therapeutic trials. Um, since May 1st uh, in 2014, the Columbia APBD project team and the APBD foundation together have collected this patient reported survey data in CAP or this Columbia APBD patient family registry. Um, this is now the largest data set for APBD patients that we know of. So the point of this, you know, retrospective natural history study, um, you know, we're using this APPD survey data set and the goal was to identify some clinical characteristics of APPD. Um, the inclusion criteria for this study was an age at onset of at least 18 years, um, symptom signs or both of the triad of peripheral neuropathy, spasticity or neurogenic bladder, um, the manifestations needed well, kind of what we did um, for the original 126 subjects that were in this uh, registry, we reviewed 46 registry variables, which included things like demographics, previous diagnoses, agent onset, and other clinical characteristics. Um, so what we did was we reviewed uh, data for patients with this onset age prior to 30 years, even though our uh, inclusion criteria was 18, we just wanted to kind of double check these patients that had super early onset ages. Um, we contacted patients with available contact information uh, to clarify incomplete, illogical, or duplicate responses. We also standardized these free text responses. So for example, um, we looked at parents and grandparents countries of birth um, in the original survey that was not created by us. Um, it was a free text response and so that had to be um, standardized. We also excluded respondents found not to have APBD in those available clinical records. Um, I just kind of want to point out that we didn't have clinical records available for everybody. Um, just, you know, if we had them, we used them. Um, and we also created a database edit log to track any changes that was made uh, that were made in this review process. And out of the 126 subjects, um, 96 patients met our inclusion criteria. And with those 96 patients and their data, we reported the analysis results in frequency tables, bar graphs, time plots, and heat maps. So one of the things that we, uh, one of the first things that we looked at, we wanted to look at the time from onset to diagnosis. Um, just kind of like looking uh, at this graph really quickly, you can see that it's very, you know, it varies from person to person. Um, there's a very wide range, anywhere from you know, almost nothing to a lot in this graph. Um, uh, so here, this is looking at sort of prior diagnoses that people got on their, you know, Odyssey to figure out that they had APBD. And these are uh, diagnoses that could mimic some of the various symptoms of APBD. You notice the most common one was neuropathy, which makes sense because neuropathy is actually a symptom of APBD. Uh, but it sort of, it's when it stops just saying, oh, you only have neuropathy, that's when sort of that, could possibly have lengthened the odyssey of figure of the diagnosis. And then some of the other things are spinal stenosis, ALS, uh, multiple sclerosis, prostate cancer, and then benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, so a common theme that everyone has been pointing out is obviously um, the majority of patients are Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Um, we, uh, numbers that we saw here, you know, not anything out of the ordinary, um, overwhelming majority, definitely Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Um, 
one thing, these patients were highly, highly, highly educated. Um, there were almost none below, you know, a high school graduate, um, which definitely can uh, bias the results just a little bit. Um, and then we also looked into the family history. So one of the questions was, um, was there any family history of APBD um, within any of your members of the family? And of 78 people that responded, 29 said yes, 43 people said no, and six said that they didn't know either way. And then we also looked at the number of reported affected family members. Um, out of the 29 patients that said yes, 26 people reported that their siblings um, had a history, three said mother or other, and two said um, their father. All right, so here's the summary. Median age at onset was 51 years. Uh, median age of diagnosis was 57. And then the average time of the diagnostic odyssey was three years. I know this is a discrepancy there. Uh, we think that it's because in this data set, actually a lot of ways that people were diagnosed is that their sibling got diagnosed and then they were encouraged to go get the diagnosis. So that really shortened the time. And we think that this is obviously sort of biased more towards a shorter duration. Um, next slide. So 52% report at least one other diagnosis prior to APBD. And then 85% reported Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. Uh, and next slide. Hello? Am I, have I become disconnected? Oh, there we go. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> 74% uh, had a college degree or higher, and then 37% had uh, reported having APBD affected relatives. Uh, so this analysis provides an initial foundation for further characterization of the disease. Uh, and then potential biases is that the study population is highly educated. There's recall bias and location bias that, you know, all of this pretty much took place in the United States, uh, even though some people were from other countries. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in this, so one of the lessons that we learned was that we had to actually do a lot of cleaning of the data uh, and sort of like Ms. Wilson used, uh, she used REDCap in, the, in her study and we'll do the same, which is a uh, research electronic data capture, which is widely used and uh, it's a good way of sort of keeping the data a little more clean and able to manage it a bit better. Uh, next slide. So future plans is to, uh, as Dr. Koch mentioned, a natural history uh, study where we would focus on the triad, neuropathy, spasticity, and bladder symptoms, as well as some of the other things that are less commonly reported, such as cognitive changes, sexual dysfunction, and fatigue. And so identifying and describing these key outcome measures and measuring them over time will be essential for future clinical trials. Uh, next slide. We'd like to uh, thank the team, the whole team in, uh, here. I'll go through them, but we're running out of time. So uh, you can read them or ask me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, JC and Francesco. Excellent use of uh, and efficient use of, of, uh, of the eight minutes that you were provided. Um, okay, and, and with that, we do have a lot of, of questions uh, in the chat, but also feel free to raise your hand. We're going to be opening it up for the, for the Q&A session. Um, and I'm just going to go, I think the first one is uh, for Samantha. Um, Lydia asks, what is the range of uncertainty in the conclusions? It's a good question. So there's a couple different ways that we have looked at this. We're not the only group that does this study. It's becoming far more common across all of genet clinical genetics to do this. Um, so there are the ability of adding confidence intervals actually on the frequency of the variance. Um, however, the, the way that you do it adds inserts some biases um, that we, we don't want to insert into that. Um, we think that increasing the size of Nomad itself and having more diversity will help with that. And so then we may consider putting it on there. It's why we give that conservative versus relaxed number is that that's sort of our confidence interval or our um, uncertainty range. But it's it's something as there's a there's a small handful of us who are doing this research right now. We talk to each other and we are trying to figure out um, how we can put a little bit better um, intervals on this. And then the next question comes from Matthew. Um, also, Samantha. <laughs> um, so based on the approximate 330 million in the US, there are approximately 70 patients in the US. Does that sound about right? 
Um, so I did write back to that in the channel and Felix made a great point. So if we just took the like, this is the percent, this is the prevalence of that we have global prevalence and we times it by the US population, that would be right. But there's the consideration of about half of the um, Ashkenazi Jewish individuals uh, do live in the US. So that biases it. So if you just do the straight math, it, it assumes that the percentage of populations um, represented in nomad is representative of the US. And that's not how it works. It gives you an estimate, but that's not how it works. So I, my guess is that it's probably closer to the 500 number um, based on just the significant portion of Ashkenazi Jewish individuals who do live in the US. Great, thank you so much. And you have lots of kudos <laughs> in there. Um, okay, oh, and I see you wrote, wrote back to Lydia there. Um, okay, I'm not sure if this one got addressed in the chat, but uh, Felix writes, more than half of the 11 million Ashkenazi Jewish population live in the US. So this should drive up the APBD affected individuals in the US to over 500. Oh, and you just kind of talked a little bit about that. Yes, yep, yes. Yep. <laughs> so it was a great um, point from Felix. Yeah, you, yeah. Can't just, you have to think about the math a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, continuing on. Uh, let's see. Here's a question for Dr. Cook and Dr. Wilson from uh, Jesse. What are your plans for data sharing and making your data available to other researchers and the public and the foundation? Um, so one, I, well, I'll tag team on, well, I know I responded to Lydia, but uh, with this question, so I guess there's three people that we want to make sure this can go to. One, the public um, at large, the foundation, other researchers, and then two, also industry companies that are looking for clinical trial recruitment. So I think upfront for clinical trial recruitment, um, I just want to say a caveat is I think the field in general, um, we're going to have trouble with this because it, we still have to protect patient confidentiality and privacy at the end of the day, and we're not approved to uh, take out, you know, to disseminate patient information, um, even if it's in hopes that it's for a, a treatment or a cure. Um, so just the caveat that I'm happy to have more conversations about how we could do this, whether it's we disseminate the information about it to our patients or, you know, what, whatever our IRB would approve, but this is a, a problem with the field as a whole. Again, we all, at the end of the day, want this information to get to the patients, but we have to still keep patient privacy and confidentiality at the forefront. Um, and then for other researchers, of course, publications, as a uh, scientist, uh, we are always eager to publish um, and get our name for more first author publications. So um, I think we'll have no trouble there in getting it out to the research and public community, but we also still have it, um, we do have approval to disseminate de-identified data. Um, so any of the information we can uh, send out to other researchers um, for that use as well. Um, again, so I, I know I've talked with the foundation about this of maybe using a global unique identifier or something where we're making sure we're not replicating uh, data as well. We don't want it to have two patients, but we don't know that they're the same patient in one data pool. Um, so just some uh, strategies to overcome that, but definitely we can share a de-identified and then hopefully publish all this data. So I guess, Genevieve, if you want to speak on your side. Sure, yes. We also um, plan to, we're working on a uh, manuscript and we are working with the APBD Research Foundation um, on a data sharing plan um, and agreement. We also do, um, you know, hope to publish this and eventually, you know, potentially validate it as a pro use for clinical trials. You know, if that is something that can happen in the future, that would be great. So yes, we do plan to um, publish this. All right, uh, Genevieve, we've got a comment for you um, <laughs> from Dr. Cook uh, that that uh, the presentation was awesome and it's exciting to see the patient's voice in the clinic. Uh, will this study's results be published and are you waiting to update the survey? <laughs> I was more just curious, yeah, what you're publishing them to, um, yeah, if you're updating the survey or what that kind of looks like. Yes, so we, um, as I mentioned, we we will be, you know, making some edits to the survey to make it a little bit um, more um, useful for directly for clinical trials or, you know, on a, on a broader scale. Um, but before that, I think we will be, you know, discussing um, publishing this data as it is, um, and then, you know, after that, working on updating the survey. Do you have any um, thoughts right now on on what kinds of updates you're considering? 
Yeah, so that means simply with the question wording and the response wording um, to make it a little bit easier to analyze the data, um, as well as defining, clearly defining the outcomes a little bit more so for our survey um, so that it can be used, you know, in a more specific clinical trial setting. Okay, and then uh, a question from Cheryl. So are you going to try to get the uh, pro measurement qualified with the FDA? Sounds like you you definitely have that in the in the future plans. Okay, all right. And then the next question uh, from Dr. Bali, has data been looked at excluding Ashkenazi Jewish patient population, which seems to um, create the bias in the data? Those were not my study. Yeah, okay, Casey. <laughs> um, yeah, so we did not. Um... I, like I guess there were only like a handful of patients that weren't of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Um, and so we uh, either I'm either oh, you here we go, JT. I think I think JC's back. <laughs> Did my internet cut out? A little bit, yes. Do you mind uh, repeating just in case? Yeah. Yeah, so um, there were only a handful of patients that were in Ashkenazi Jewish descent, um, and so that, that wasn't just anything that we came up with, that just wasn't something that we thought of, um, but yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Oh, I think I just saw that um, Dr. Bali asked about um, I think she, my I data think, looking at oh, it without okay. Ashkenazi Jewish. Um, we, we absolutely can do that and, and remove it. Um, it's uh, it, the way that we weigh things. I guess the summary is yes, we could do it. Um, I don't think it's strongly that it's a bias, but um, that we could sort of look at, it takes a little bit of wrangling because you then have to subtract the world's population that is thought to be Ashkenazi Jewish. And so it just, again, with a lot of this, like the more you mess with the data, the more biases you introduce. So that's why we just couch and caveat everything with like, these are estimates and we try to do it at the lowest, simplest level so that you can see the math and follow it, but um, also understand the caveats that go along with it. I have a question. Um, so for the CAP registry, I was curious um, from the standpoint of, I, I believe, and correct me if this is wrong, but for the inclusion criteria, if you had to be over 18, correct, for or when symptoms start out. So uh, have you encountered any patients? I know primarily a lot of yours were Ashkenazi Jewish, so it's, you know, we're likely to see more about later onset, but have you encountered any that report um, symptoms earlier than 18 when they reflect that? Yeah, actually, well, so we, so strangely enough, we had someone who it was their mother who had registered them and it was actually at birth. And so we were concerned that we, you know, so when that happens, we were concerned that we're actually getting a different di disease, possibly another GBE1 mutation, but like Alexander's disease, something else that could be causing this. So that's why we made the criteria 18, just to make sure that we really gained the adult part of the adult polygroup symptomatic disease. I guess my only, and this is more just an existential thought, because again, I think I've hinted that I'm interested in seeing the spectrum, um, but I, I, we've seen with some of our patients that again, they could go on to develop neurological symptoms um, later that are consistent with APBD. So again, it's still something we don't understand, but that's my, again, I, I think that's the beauty of why we could have different studies, right? I think you guys are targeting something that's different than ours, um, but that's just something that goes through my thought of, um, as we start to understand this more, if, if both of us, if we'll have to look at how we're including these patients and how we're expanding them. Yeah, definitely. Um, we just, we found that when those people sort of mentioned that it was 18, that a lot of times they had another sort of mutation that actually oh, better. Yeah, 100%. No, it's a, it's a complex disease for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, we are almost out of time. So last, last uh, attempt at any questions, if there's any from the audience. Um, oh, here we go. Dr. Ackman has a question. He says, few mutations yeah. are- This is Shannon Thompson. Oh. Arthur, can you hear me? Oh, yes, please. We can hear you. Oh, want to try again? Hi, are you asking for Dr. Ackman or for Seamus so, Thompson? So uh, these, these two people are, who are speaking are part of our team. Uh, that's yeah, Dr. Arhan, go ahead. Head statistician, 
and uh, Dr. Oren Achman, who's co-PI of the project. So Dr. Achman is just commenting that a few mutations are due to founder effect, so they can be easily be excluded, but we also saw a few patients who they don't know if they are Ashkenazi Jewish. So it would be difficult to exclude them for real unless self-reported. So he's sort of just commenting on the difficulty of just looking at the data while excluding the, um, the sort of the Ashkenazi Jewish uh, population and sort of talking about what Dr. Baxter said, which is it does create its own bias. So it's better sort of just to look at everything and just yeah, so like the way that it's done now with these these PCAs, which is the principal component analysis, which is just your genomic ancestry, is that, again, we try to put you in a box. So these individuals who are not put into that box, we do not know whether it was the algorithm, they're actually part Ashkenazi Jewish, um, and the algorithm put them into another box or not. And even with self-reported, we can't necessarily know that. We are moving closer and closer to something called locally um, inferred ancestry um, or local something similar to that, um, where it actually is able to look at parts of the gene or the gene itself. And it's it's sort of irrelevant if we're looking at this, what the rest of your genomic ancestry is at that gene. Are you primarily Ashkenazi Jewish or not? And then we would actually be able to start excluding it. We're just in this in-between stage right now where we are kind of we're, we're kind of like high schoolers. We know just enough to be dangerous. So I'm, I'm very conservative on sort of what we do with the math because of that. I think we're getting to the place we'll be able to be more powerful with it, but we're not quite there yet and could introduce more biases. Samantha, and then Erin, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask your question? Yes, great. Thank you, Olivia. Um, Sam, Awesome presentation, likewise to um, all of the other presenters. Sam, I know we squished you in and you didn't have a chance to talk about RGP's diagnostic efforts. And I don't know if you wanted to just take a minute now, maybe to, to share. Yeah, I can let that. everybody know. Sorry, in the short time, I didn't get to it. So I just said our recruitment arm and moved on from it. But um, I work as part of a larger team, as many people here do. Um, one of, part of our team actually um, works on this rare genomes project where we are able to offer free sequencing for individuals with undiagnosed Mendelian disorders or um, rare disease. So if there's anybody here either um, works with um, patient communities or is actually a patient themselves and doesn't have access to genetic testing in other manners, um, there is sort of a pre-screening survey just to make sure that people really do have the diagnosed Mendelian or undiagnosed Mendelian disease. Um, but we do offer free genome sequencing um, with clinical confirmation so that the, the results are returned through a physician. And it's re Rare Genomes Project. You can Google it and, and um, get to the website pretty quickly. But if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out and I'll connect you with our um, recruitment team. Yeah, 